Hi, Kathy. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody, I think. Oops. Do you feel more powerful from that, Kathy? <laughs> you know, I actually can't do it. My cursor keeps jumping. So, Amy, do you want to go ahead and do that? To um... just mute. Well, I'm happy to just mute my own. Mute. Yeah, if you can just yeah, mute your can own mute mics them, right I'll now. Figure it out. Yeah, that'll be great. We're, we're still novices with Zoom Oh, I here. found that. Oh, I know how to mute you all now. You're muted. <laughs> all right. Well, let me say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you muted yourself. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Amy. I got this little flash on the screen. You are muted. Um, first of all, thank you very much, and hello, happy Friday. We made it through another week. It's been a month, even though it's only April 3rd, and it was a terrible last month as well. I hope everyone's doing um, well and staying healthy. Uh, I want to welcome you to our second live Feedback Friday. We started last week, and we had about 50 people sign up. We've had over 100 sign up this time, so we'll have people joining us, I'm sure. I'm also recording this, so in case you can't make it, um, or you couldn't make it, you can uh, watch this live or watch this recorded. Um, happy Earth Month, everybody. It's Earth Month. We're feeling it for sure. Aren't you glad you're a natural dyer and you're not like a petroleum extractor or something? Because the Earth is definitely telling us, uh, giving us some messages right now. Um, I just wanted to also thank everybody who's been supporting us. We've had um, a pretty steady influx of online orders and that has been keeping us afloat. We've had to completely close our production facility, uh, even though it is a separate facility and we could work um, remotely, it's not essential. So, and besides most of our customer base has um, postponed all of their deliverables because they're not open either. So um, half of my staff is at home and then um, the other half is working on online orders, but we're having to social distance. So there's only one person in the studio at, at any one time. But thank you. It, it's really, really helping. And it's giving me the ability to be a lot calmer. Otherwise, I think I would be just on the roof, you know, right now um, doing some level of howling. Uh, the other thing is that we have um, a couple of classes coming up from um, friends of ours, um, Scrambles Quilts, who's Kristen Arts. Kristen is based out of Oakland, California, and she's doing uh, an Indigo Shibori class that starts today. But she has an upcoming pigment class and how to use um, exhausted dye baths to create pigments and use them for watercolor or paint or some other application printing. Uh, she's going to be doing that and she'll have, um, we have a little kit here that is going to support her class, but basically she's going to have you walk through how to create these um, natural dye lakes that then become uh, the basis for mixing with either other media to become paints or to use in any way that you really uh, are interested in. Uh, in order to create additional color from um, your dye bath. So it's a nice way of using up the very last bits of your dyes because all the dyes are precious now. We've got abilities to go forage and this is a way to continue to experiment so that you can see what's going on with um, the colors that you're creating. So that's going to be exciting. Um, Car Marie Piazza, uh, who's on our call today, is uh, doing a cosmic t-shirt class. And that starts on Tuesday, and we're doing a little support um, kit for it that looks like it's packed full of all these different dyes that you can use for so um, bundle dyeing. I know. <laughs> I found these bags in our surplus bag thing, and I thought, oh, these are going to be perfect. Um, yeah, so they've got, I think, four different dyes in them and um, some mordant. And so Cara will be um, teaching the class and that's the follow along materials that go with the class. So um, both of those are happening. We have uh, coupon codes 
for discounts on the products as well as the classes. So if you're interested, you can still sign up for that. Okay, I'm gonna actually, today we have a guest um, speaker, Melissa Moses from Plant Workshop in uh, on the Cape, Cape Cod. So Botanical Colors, for those of you who don't know, we're kind of a bi-coastal company. I'm based here in Seattle. Amy um, Dufo, who's our co-host, is based in uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts in Mashpee. And the, the nice thing about it is that we have a, a very strong East Coast presence as well as uh, a West Coast presence because both of us live on opposite coasts. And Amy introduced me to Melissa Moses uh, from Plant Workshop earlier this year. I went out to the Cape to do um, some training, I guess it was last year. And um, we, we visited Melissa and it was just, it's a beautiful, amazing, a workshop that she has. She does a lot of um, growing for both medicinal uh, beneficial herbs as well as dye plants. And so Melissa's going to go through the basics of starting your own seeds, um, what's best for what climate, and we have a ton of questions that both Melissa and I will be um, answering. And it's just going to be like a conversation between us. So join us. Um, Melissa, there you are. I we're on and I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. Um, <laughs> bear with me up until like a week ago, I had tape over my computer. So this is really, really new for me. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so I started some seeds, both indoors and outs, uh, outdoors and indoors um, for the past couple of years now. Uh, this year I'm growing for CSA, which I'm really excited. I just started a seed. Uh, growing for CSA. Um, but so I'm going to quickly, because there is a, there are a lot of really great questions that kind of work with the seedling portion, but um, I'm going to quickly kind of go through what um, you would need to start your seedlings. Um, so this, I don't know if you can see me, how do I make my screen bigger? Oh wait, now Kathy's. You're, when you talk, oh. Melissa, you're full screen. Okay. Oh, cool. Okay. I'm not on my screen. I'm seeing it full matter. screen. Yeah. Okay. So let me just, like I said, bear with me. Um, so you're going to need a container. If you have seedling containers, great. But if not, you could use like a plastic recycled container, um, yogurt container. You guys have a great list on, uh, is that, was that in Feedback Friday a couple of weeks ago? It's in our Instagram uh, bio link, but I can send it to everybody. I'll make a note. It's 20, 20 things you can use from around your house, like what Melissa's holding, like a strawberry container that you can use to put your new um, seeds in. Babies. Um, the one thing to look out for is if it has drainage or not. So some of the containers don't have plastic holes in the bottom. So you would just want to poke holes through the bottom because um, this is also how you're going to water it. The best way to water is just to kind of to sit this in like a baking dish or um, like a baking sheet and let it water from below because if you water your ceilings from above they're gonna move all around so um, until they're really well established just water them from below um, and then you probably need soil maybe maybe you have a bag maybe you're like where am I gonna get this right now um, but I think probably hardware stores are open, um, but you could also just, I mean, you might have to get creative with what's in your yard. Maybe you have like a old, old planters with old potting soil in them. That's probably not the best because there's not um, sterile, like the, you know, fresh seed start would be, but um, you got to do what you got to do. So uh, the most important thing is to start with it wet. You wouldn't want to fill this with dry soil and then try to water it. Um, so use a bucket or some kind of container and um, dribble some warm water in there because, uh, you know, for your hands, you want nice warm water, not freezing cold water. And then work it into kind of like a moldable shape, not too muddy, not too dry. Pack it in, really kind of like tamp it down. You want to make sure everything packs in there. And then uh, you are ready to seed. Um, oh, label. Don't forget to label this because if you're doing a whole bunch of seeds and you're like, oh, what did I just do? So um, label it first. That's usually I kind of lay everything out with the seedling packets. I'll label all my stuff first 
And then, cause if you walk away and you come back and you're like, oh my God, where did I just leave off? So um, labeling, uh, da, 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 da. where did I leave off here? Um, and then you're ready to seed. Believe it or not, I left my seeds at home today. <laughs> But I luckily have some seeds. Um, so you're probably like, how deep do I plant the seed? Basically twice its size deep. So if you have like a, um, a sunflower seed, it's like that deep, you'd want to plant it like that deep. So like a really small seed, like um, goldenrod or chamomile or um, like coreopsis or something like that, you would just sprinkle it on top and then tamp it down done that's it um you could mist them maybe a little bit but just be really careful because sometimes the misters are so strong that they'll like and your seeds will fly away um and then uh then you're ready for it to go in its location so choose that wisely because you're gonna have to baby these for I don't know what's what's today like a month and a half so these are going to be sitting on your windowsill or on your kitchen table or wherever they are for like a month and a half so they're going to need lots of light um heat and moisture and some airflow so um like a closet isn't the best location even if it has a light in it um you're going to need a lot of airflow because your seedlings can get moldy um so those are the three most important things as far as like where you're going to put them light heat moisture um, sometimes a window sill isn't enough um, a grow light really is super beneficial um, window sill if you're if you're doing that you're going to want to rotate it around because um, it's going to start to grow towards the sun one way or the other um, it's also probably going to get kind of leggy this is one of the questions but if it's not getting enough sun, it's gonna grow really tall and have these like these little leaves that come off. It's gonna be this like long thing. Um, and that's just because it's like searching for the sun. So it needs, at that point, you gotta get it more sun um, or get it outside, that can happen. Um, so you're looking up your frost date, wherever you are. Um, for the Cape, <laughs> uh, the weather is really weird here, but um, usually it's like mid-May but some stuff has to wait even longer. Um, I think I planted my indigo uh, like early June last year. Um, it was cold here. So it has to be warm enough um, for all of these sensitive things. Some stuff, are, some things aren't so sensitive and they can go out right away like coreopsis, chamomile, um, you know, anything that's really tender like indigo when, when you want to wait a little bit. Um, so then you're ready to, once your frost date, you figured out when you're going to put them outside, um, you want to backtrack like four days and you want to do what's called hardening off where you kind of put them out for the day to get them acclimated and then you bring them in at night. Um, so you would find like a spot out of the wind, out of the sun, kind of like a shady sheltered spot and then just hang out for the day. Don't forget about them. <laughs> um, and then bring them in at night and uh, do that for a few days and then um, you're ready to plant. You would want to um, really water your area before. You could also um, wait until it's rained. That's probably the best option is to kind of plant it around the weather. Um, use that to your advantage. You also don't want to plant on a really, really sunny day, even though that's really nice and for us to work in, the plants would be like, what is happening? So uh, shady day is, or cloud, uh, Cloudy days is better um, to transplant on a cloudy day. Uh, should we start questions? Because I feel like there's some really good ones that we can kind of. Sure, I know there's a lot of. There's a lot of. Um, yeah, let's start questions. Thanks, Melissa. I know um, she's been helping me a lot with my the other half of this table that you can't see is all egg cartons. How are they doing? Containers and. I've been listening to Melissa and I actually have some really cute Dyer's chamomile coming up right now. And I have some uh, marigold flowers. Of course, all seeds I bought at Botanical Colors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do you want me to
me to just ask the questions, Melissa, and then you can answer them. And sure, sure. there might maybe some that we collaborate on. Yeah, yeah, there's okay. definitely because I don't know. Okay, all. great. The first one is uh, I don't have a large garden space for planting, roughly a three by five foot space. So that's like a meter by a meter and a half. Um, is it better to make more? Or is it better or does it make more sense to grow several plants of one dye type? Or can I have a variety of three or four dye plants? And what's enough, what, how much do I need in order to, you know, if I grow multiples, how, how much do I need? Um, this is a really good question because I think this is probably a lot of a, a situation for a lot of people because that's a nice little small spot. Um, so I think there's probably two answers for this because it, depending on how you're dying, the dying process, um, if you're doing bundle dyeing, you could plant that little spot with a whole bunch of different plants and I think get away with having a small amount of one, <clears throat> excuse me, one variety. Um, but if you're doing like dye pot, you know, skeins of yarn or something like that, you probably would want to fill that with one or two varieties, I, I would think. Um, but also experimenting with um, different mordants to kind of you know, maybe you can only get, maybe you're only going, growing Coreopsis in there, which would actually be a great, I think a good choice because you can plant that really close together and get a lot of bang from one plant because you can use all the different parts of that, the leaves, the rosettes, the whatever, um, and you can fit more of that plant in that space. Um, but uh, I, I think it's usually like a pound, or I'm sorry, um, uh, same equal weight of plant fiber. I'm sorry. Right. Yes. Yes. You, you want, want a one to one, to one ratio. So yeah. if you have, if you have, um, like this is Coreopsis. If I have this much Coreopsis, it's probably three ounces, maybe. Then I would be able to dye a very strong color, three ounces of a fiber. But you could also, you would also have um, exhaust baths or what we call leftover baths, and you can continue. Right. to get more and more color from those and as well at the very end if you learn how to make a pigment you could make a pigment from it yeah. the other thing is that there's a lot of the plants i find uh, melissa and just tell me if you think this is also correct um you can actually deadhead or cut all the blossoms off and then your plant's going to continue to grow right right and you're going to be able to get another flush of flowers and another and another and yeah. so you can harvest over a season and gather it all together even just from one or two plants right right like a cut and come again right exactly yeah. and yeah. it's true with um the japanese style indigo lee is it is it true with the um sifructicosa indigo you have to unmute sorry it's on the lower left yeah there you go you're, okay. you're good yeah, um, I harvest all summer basically just cutting the tops of the uh -huh. plant off okay. slowly okay. and, you know, um, over the season. Right. Um, everyone, this is Lee Magar, and she uh, is um, the person who is supplying us with this beautiful uh, Indigo Ferra sapropticosa, which is a different variety than the Persicaria, which most of us have grown. Um, it's a sub. Lee's um, variety is a subtropical plant. So if you're in a warm, humid, South Carolina type uh, climate, then you could actually grow this seed. Yeah, thank definitely. You, yeah, thank you, Kathy. Hey, okay, the next question is- uh, um, Kathy, can I just jump in? So I'm gonna keep, um, people are sending questions in too based on what you're saying a little bit. So, but yep. Lee, somebody was just asking um, how close do you plant seedlings on planting indigo? Maybe you can, uh, do you want to answer that? The seedlings of the indigo? How yeah, close do to... you plant them when you're, when you're planting when... them? Oh, I usually plant them about three feet apart just because I like the space. I like to move around the field. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it just depends on your preference. You can plant one to three feet apart. But I recommend further is best um, because they can get pretty tall, up to 10 feet tall. And, um, you know, it just depends on how much space you have to really. But uh, like I said, I like to move around and I harvest all season, all summer. So you have to be able to get, you know, through the plants and around the plants. 
Uh, yeah, thanks. so um, Lee's speaking specifically to the Sufructicosa, which is the very tall shrub-like indigo. The Persicaria that we also sell uh, online, which is the Grand Prismatic Japanese indigo, usually gets about, what, two feet tall? So it's a smaller plant. Its habit is more like, kind of like an herb, like basil. Mm -hmm. So it, it's from the ground up and it's a smaller plant. You can plant those, what, a foot apart, 12 inches, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also there's um, Roland Ricketts. I just looked, let me see if I can share this screen. I'm gonna try my best here. Uh, don't see anything on share screen. Okay, so we'll send you the link of um, Roland. And he has actually, if you're growing the Persicaria tinctoria, which is the Japanese indigo, what he shows you is how to start the seedlings, how to plant them out, how far to plant them, how to harvest them, and then the Japanese style of making tsukumo, which is the fermented um, indigo balls. There's other ways of getting the dye from the plant, but this is the traditional Japanese method. So Amy, we'll, we'll do a link to Roland's information. It's very comprehensive, I think. If you're at all interested in that and you have room, to grow that much indigo, then um, it's a very good uh, guideline. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question, which is, would matter be relegated to greenhouse growing only? I live in Rhode Island and I'm about to start some Japanese indigo seeds. Any idea of how much harvest I should anticipate or the challenges that lie ahead for this season? I've never grown it before. Um, well, I've, so I've grown Japan, Japanese indigo, but I haven't yet grown matter. So maybe. Okay. You want to speak to the indigo and then I'll talk about matter? Sure. Um, so uh, for how much to anticipate or, well, I mean, I think from a single plant, um, I probably should have thought this through before I, um, I think a single plant, I think I, so I planted about, I harvested about 12 plants and I got a bucket worth to make fresh leaf. So um, this was, I'm not sure what it would be for, um, phone is ringing, um, for powder, but I, I got about a bucket's worth, if I'm remembering correctly, from about 12 plants, because I, I planted about 24 plants and I did half my harvest. So did you cut it and it came back? Or yeah, did you yeah, pull I pull it. Okay. I cut it and to come back again. I, I harvested okay. three times last year from okay. um, and a and bucket of leaves it. every time. Yeah, I did buckets. Um, I did fresh leaf with Amy one one time. Um, actually, that might have been the um, yeah. So I would say it was like twelve plants made like filled a bucket where I cut okay. most of the plant down to come back and right. filled, filled okay. the bucket. So. 10 to 12 plants will give you enough to do like a series of silk scarves yeah. if you wanted to try the fresh leaf method. Um, if you're trying to dry it and then use it, uh, you probably need more indigo than that because mm -hmm. once it's dried and then you go through the um, process of um, extracting the, the indigo pigment, you're only getting a fraction of pigment yeah. versus the actual um, biomass of the plant. So um, that's why I think for in Roland's um, discussion about indigo, one of the things he says is that you have to grow like 400 row feet, which is an enormous amount. They need, they need like a, a lot of indigo yeah. in order to create enough for, for one traditional Japanese style vat. So it, it's a, if you don't have that much room, don't despair. You can still use it fresh. Right. Right. I mean, that's fine. And you'll get a beautiful aqua color. It's, it's really pretty. Um, regarding matter. So I don't think matter needs a greenhouse. Um, yeah. I'm growing matter outside and it's mm -hmm. in just a pot. And so um, the, you know, it's, it's invasive. So you yeah. want to keep it contained, but, um, and then check for seeds in the late uh, summer and fall because once those drop then they're going to start more matter plants 
and and so you want to just kind of make sure that you're keeping it in the space it needs to be otherwise it's going to kind of decide to take over everything matters also um uh it takes three years before you get a good a good enough size root and i i don't know if you can see this it's still like dripping dirt but when we were um there we go that's that's from our matter plant that i just I don't know. Can you see the red end? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot of dye in it. This is um, Tinctoria. Like yesterday, I dripped paint all over my keyboard, and today I'm dropping dirt. <laughs> but uh, I have to get another camera. Um, yeah. So this is just stuff that was that was left over. I would say that this is probably the size of a root that's maybe a year to a year and a half uh, old, and that larger root. Um, I have some larger roots. These are um, from uh, another grower who's been supplying us. And so this is actually, this is where it goes out of the ground. And then this is where all the root mass was. So um, it's all clumped together. And if you're going to use stuff like this, you're going to need to break it apart before you die with it. Um, so the next question is, um, is talking about weld, which we also have seeds. We have seeds both from um, bedhead fiber as well as from a grower here in Northern Washington. And, it, and the question is, um, I'm happy to say I have some weld coming up this spring in my yard. Uh, I believe it's a biennial. Can I pick from the plant this year for color? What colors uh, are the leaves versus the flowers? Um, Melissa? I haven't oh, grown okay. weld yet. Okay, I, I can answer some, some of this part. Um, so yeah, you can still get color after the first year if you've got some foliage coming off of your weld plant. So the way weld grows is there's kind of this little rosette that's close to the ground and then it sends up this stalk. And the stalk is all leafy and um, has these yellow flowers. And that's what most people use in order to make the dye. But if you've got some greenery, you can definitely use it. Um, you'll get different colors of yellow uh, based on what part of the plant you use. The flowers, so in this, a biennial is means that it's ready the second year. Um, so the flowers at, at the second year are the strongest with the leaves being about as strong. And it's only that very thick stalk where you're gonna see a lighter yellow. But the whole plant is used. Anything above the ground is used uh, for weld. Um, the next is about regarding, uh, yeah. Can I ask you, somebody just regarding well, is weld um, invasive in the Midwest at all? Do you know? Um, so the one plant that is uh, regionally invasive that I know about is woad. So woad is a type of indigo, uh, mostly grown in um, Europe and some in China. And it is um, noxious weed in the 11 western states so we don't grow it out here in seattle california idaho montana utah you know nevada california arizona not not allowed to be grown so if you do come across some people say to me well i always make sure i um, collect the seeds but you know i i tend to be an air on the side of caution person in terms of invasive species so i would not plant it if you're in um, the west but if you're uh, on the eastern seaboard or in the east, yes, you can grow woad because I believe the, the climate is cold enough to actually kill it um, every year. So weld is not invasive as far as I know. Do you know, Melissa? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I heard about but woad. it sounds like woad and yeah. I think that's why people get them confused. Yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, is there a variety of marigold that is best for dyeing? Um, I believe it's the lion. It's lion's mane, right? Did you guys have that seed? The big, the big giant. This is. Um, these are like three-inch blossoms. Yeah. This one. Yeah. yeah. We. Um, I think we're out. I mean, this is the last pack. I was going to try and grow it. <laughs> Do you have some? Amy does, right? Yes, and I will share. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. But yeah, that's the uh, one that grows like really nice and big. There's a like a 
tons of petals in them um, and it gives really beautiful color and you get a, a you know that's a it's like a huge yeah color. I mean it's a you get a lot of yield but yeah. the small um, French marigolds the little tiny ones that we're used to seeing that are clumped and used a lot for landscaping those work just as well um, and you know, on the dried marigolds that we're selling just as a dried marigold flower, dye flower, you can just take the seeds out of those and, and grow them. Mm -hmm. um, they're fresh from last season. So just take one of your blooms or take, you know, look at the bloom, look at the color if you like the color, because some of them are variegated, some are yellow, some are orange. Just take seeds and plant those. Those will work just fine. Hey, uh, Kathy and Melissa, do you, do you find that if marigold's too old that it's... Um... Maybe not. It's too old to die. What somebody's asking is it is marigold kind of does it expire? Is basically the question. The color expire, disappear. I but, haven't waited that long to die with <laughs> with them. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I have I've, stuff that may be two years old. I mean, we could try it, but I haven't had that experience. And then last week on our call, someone, um, I think it was Thea, told us that the viability of the seeds is between four and five years. Five years. So. If you have a few marigold um, blossoms that you want to save, you can save them for a number of years and still plant them. Okay, um, let's see. I live in Australia. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I missed one. The question is, is what would be the best mordant to use for cotton? Um, so on the Botanical Colors website, under the How To section, we have an entire um, discussion about mordantine. And so we have multiple mordant recipes for cellulose fibers. And there's no one best. Um, it just kind of depends on what you're trying to do for color. Uh, we do offer you the recipes that we use the most. So I guess we think those are the best, but um, those are definitely out there. Um, the next question is, I live in Australia and I'm in the process of starting my backyard dye garden. Uh, currently have marigolds growing, but was wondering what other plants you would recommend for growing in Australia. I don't know much. I was going to say eucalyptus. I would just grow so much eucalyptus. <laughs> um, right. I'm not sure of their, like, where in Australia. So the northern part is more tropical. Okay. And the southern part is more temperate. And the middle is quite arid. I mean, yeah. I would say it's mostly arid to drier climate. So more, more like California, Arizona, New Mexico, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't quite know. Um, so I think the easiest thing to do is if you can correlate what your, um, what your own growing zone is, wherever you are either in the world with either USDA growing zones for plants, if you can find information, but obviously there's lots and lots of um, information out there, country by country and region by region that will tell you what's suitable for growing. And then if you look at the botanical name of the dye plant you're interested in, it, you can definitely say, oh, okay, so mm -hmm. in the US and in Germany and in, um, Latin America, this is the zone that it needs, and this is the zone that I am. So therefore, yes, I can grow it, or you know, maybe I can grow it under special circumstances. So you know, unfortunately, we're very, at least I'm very West Coast centric. I don't even know what is available to grow in other regions of the United States or Canada. Um, but the way that I figure it out is I know what my own growing zone is, and then I look at what the plant can do and then if I have to translate that to another country zone, there should be a correlation in terms of either temperatures or rainfall or some um, characteristics of your own growing area that you would be able to then look and make that evaluation. Hmm. Okay. Um, what are the top tips for those who are growing the Persicaria from seed, especially in colder climates? Um, well, hopefully you've already started it by now because we it is colder up here uh, or in the in the New, New England. Um, but I think if you can grow, like Kathy was saying, basil or tomatoes, you're good. You know, it needs a lot of you know light and um, heat and moisture. But 
um, and really good fertile soil. So if you, I think if you have all of that, even in a colder climate, as long as you wait, you know, baby it inside until it's warm enough out. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a generally pretty easy plant to grow as long as you have, you know, fertile soil, lots of water and light, I think, I, I think, you know, right. you'll be fine outside in, in a colder climate. Yeah, I, the only thing that you might have is a shorter growing season, meaning that if you don't, if you're not able to put your plants out till June, like you are, yeah. then by September, you're kind of done. And so if you want to save seeds, often what I've done, because I'm in Seattle, by, by September 30th, it's, the sun has shifted so radically that we can't really get good growing anymore. So I've taken seeds and potted them up and then just brought them indoors. And they will send up a flower shoot and you'll get some seeds off of them. You don't get a ton, but you do get some. Um, let's see, next question. And uh, Amy, anything from the audience that we need to? Yes, all kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> Good. I'm trying to encourage uh, folks to um, answer some of the questions in chat too by communicating with each other. Like, um, oh, okay. If Grace can answer maybe about in chat about the uh, fresher dyed or dried dye plants, that would be great because she's good good with that. But um, one of the one of the questions that Kara had asked uh, at the beginning was, are there certain species or certain plants that grow better in containers? Where she's in a, an apartment in Brooklyn, you know, like is there are there better marigolds or you know what what could she grow in her apartment well definitely indigo i mean i grew indigo for a class once and so i had to have 36 pots of indigo <laughs> for the students i know it was one of those crazy things so everybody got like a pot of you know I, I had like a pot this size and it had one plant in it and um every student got i, th I think i had two plants per student so they got two pots each and that worked just fine. Um, we had to grow them, like you would have to, I mean, with that many plants, I grew them in pots outside, right? Mm -hmm. But if you were inside and in a, an apartment and you had enough sun or you had access to like a little balcony or some sort of windowsill, then you could definitely uh, grow uh, French marigolds are small. They're maybe like a 18 inch tall plant and those are, ones that you can just continually harvest. And the more you harvest, the more blooms you get, the more blooms you get, the more color you get. Um, indigo, you could also harvest. Um, is there anything else you've grown in a pot, Melissa? Not for, um, you could try it. Well, calendula. Um, yep. I don't think that's. Chamomile? Um, probably, yeah, like a, the uh -huh. tall one, not the yeah. Um, German. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, chamomile, calendula. Mm -hmm. What about um, cornflower? Oh, yeah, yeah, bachelor buttons. Yeah, because you can put those close together too. You could probably yeah. get a couple plants in a pot. Yep. Um, cor I think you could probably do coreopsis in a pot. That'd be actually really beautiful and like. Just yeah. Sweet. Definitely no sunflower though, right? <laughs> well, if you I mean, you could, you just have to stay like one. <laughs> one, yeah, one stalk. I mean, I think if you use your imagination and you have enough soil in a large enough pot, you can pretty much grow anything. I mean, I have like a, years. I have like a tree behind me. I might be able to do one sunflower. <laughs> yeah, I definitely. It needs a sunflower. ton of um, fertilizer. It love. It's a heavy feeder. Okay. So, yeah, my, like, pet, my second pet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> second pet. Okay, um, uh, we've got about 20 more minutes and we've got about six more um, questions. So I want to get through these quickly and um, then open it up for any last minute questions and then talk about what we're going to, what we're thinking about doing for next week. Um, I'm growing eight different types of dye plants in raised beds. Are there any plants that should definitely not be planted next to each other? I was confounded by this. I couldn't think of it. I don't I mean, think there's not. We yeah. don't, I, I have never seen that. The only yeah. thing is that matter is invasive. So if you're right. going to grow matter, 
it should be, you know, you should put a barrier in between that and the rest of the bed so it just doesn't overtake the bed. Yeah, yeah. And then how many uh, indigo plants do I need to make a fresh dye bath using Persicaria? Um, so um, what do we, what it was four? it, like 12, like how many? Well, 12 would do a bucket, but I mean, if you just had a small oh, amount, just, just, yeah. two to four. Two to four plants. Yeah. Yeah. And then to grow the, to collect seed for next year, next what you year. would need to do is save some of those, if you have more than four plants, save the <laughs> plant and let it go to seed. Let it send up its flower stalk. You'll see these tiny little blossoms. The birds love them. Mm -hmm. So, um, take that into account uh, or if you need to pot up some uh, because your weather has turned too cold in the fall then you can grow them indoors and I think I kept mine alive through January and it finally gave up some seeds wow. but it took a while it's much slower than if it were outdoors because of course it's indoor light um, the this question about how do you keep your plants from getting long and leggy, you've already answered that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the light source. It's trying to find the light. Um, and so if you have light closer, or if you have a grow light and you put the light grow light down, mm -hmm. then your seeds will get stocky and then you can just keep growing, moving the grow light as um, your plants get larger so that it doesn't get really leggy. Has anyone generated a comprehensive map of local botanical dye stuffs? So the answer is kind of yeah. Um, does anybody have this book? It's called North American Dye Plants by, by Anne Bliss. I believe in, well, you can buy it used. It's no longer in print, but, and it's, it's very, it's usually not very expensive. I think mine was $1.99. Um, she has all sorts of, you know, she's got a beautiful black and white illustration and then uh, the botanical name uh, of it. So, and she doesn't really say where. Um, she talks a little bit about Mordentine, but I mean, this is a 288 page book. So there's, there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, Oh no, I bought it for $10 at, from uh, Powell's used books in uh, Portland, Oregon. But still, this is a great book. Yeah, that's a score. Uh, I'll add it to the, uh, the email after this. Yeah, to... and all I have to say is if you can buy it from Powell's books, please do. They're an independent uh, that is really trying to stay in business during this difficult time. Um, but uh, you can find this in a lot of places. There's another book that's called Native North American dye plants and it's a it's a hardbound book but it's out of print and I just looked it up um, on Amazon yes that one dies from Native American plants American native plants uh, it's a great book again but it it used right now is about ninety dollars so it's yeah it's super expensive um, if you can find one or check it out from your library when your library reopens please do uh, you might also be able to find it online at, um, you know, with a Google book. Um, so that's a good one. And, uh, oh, good. So people are just giving uh, other resource. Um, yeah, we're thank all you. sharing over here. We've got like- Thank so you very talk. much. Yeah. Okay. I got two more questions and then we can open it up for other questions. Um, I live in New Jersey on a 16 acre farm with a large garden. I'd like to grow indigo. Uh, and have started plants inside. What advice can you give me for growing success? Okay, so uh, the whole Roland Ricketts website has it from start to finish. And if you get all the way to harvest and you decide that you want to extract your indigo in a different way or use it a different way, just think about it. You've got it, you're growing it, now you're gonna cut it. Once you cut it, you can either use it for a fresh dye bath which there's tons of information online. We can provide that information. I think we even have a blog post on it, Amy. Um, the other one is if you wanna to try to make a Japanese style um, skumo, then there's a way to do that. Uh, you basically have to bring in a Shinto priest, but that's okay. Um, we'll figure that out. You can figure that out when it's harvest time. 
And then that last thing is um, you can also just dry the indigo and then re, um, what do you call it, reconstitute it. And we have a book by John Marshall that's called um, Singing the Blues. This one. And he talks about how to use dried indigo, dried uh, persicaria. So he's got that information in his book. Uh, I also just saw a post from um, Michelle Garcia, who many of you know, uh, and he's talking about how to use dried indigo. So there's a lot of resources out there. If you don't want to buy a book, then you can definitely search online. We'll get you that um, reference for the dried indigo from Michelle Garcia. I saw it in my Facebook feed. Um, and then the last question, uh, in addition to planting and harvest instructions from seed packets, are there any good resources to find info when to harvest indigo uh, and, and what visual signs to look for? So again, Roland has an amazing thing. He shows like what the plant is supposed to look like. Um, I was growing indigo out on a farm a couple of years ago and all of my leaves were starting to curl up and they were turning red. I took a picture and I sent it to him and he said, oh my God, you need to feed them. So then we put um, a kelp spray on them and they just bounced right back. So enough, enough uh, nutrients for the indigo is really important. And so uh, fertile soil is, is important and or fish emulsion, kelp emulsion, any type of um, foliar feeding is good too. Okay. One more question. <laughs> What? <laughs> <laughs> is matter, do you know if matter is deer tolerant? I don't know. Is it a perennial is the question. It's a perennial. Yep. It's, it's a long, long lived perennial. I have harvested matter out of uh, a 35 year old matter bed. Wow. Yeah, it's beautiful stuff. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Yes. Um, so the, I hope I'm saying it right, the Murasaki that we're selling, oh, right. you have to dig it up at the end of the season and put it well, somewhere. No, it's a three-year plant, so you have to grow it for three years. But you have to get it out of the ground after you every- You do, and I'm trying to find my little, I had a Murasaki. That's not the same for matter, though. Matters can just stay in the ground. And, well, but, matter, I, I'm sure with Murasaki, you could probably do the same. You could just pull part of the plant, dig up part of the plant, use part of the roots. Um, and then use it, you know, so you could have it as a perennial. I don't know if it's invasive. I, I don't know much about it. I've asked um, somebody to grow some for me, but they're not sure that they want to, you know, leave a, a part of the field for three years because they don't, because they, we don't know about the yield. So it's a bit of an experiment, but um, it could Alyssa really and I will be doing that in her garden <laughs> summer, Hirosaki trial, so. All right. Uh, yeah. That sounds great. Um, any any other questions? There's some here on the side from Laura Berkowitz. Um, I bought indigo seeds while in Japan. The package says Polygonum tinctorium. Is that the same as Persicaria tinctoria? Yes, it is. It goes by two different names. Oh yeah, and then Karen's saying here that um, you can see in the chat on the side, the deer didn't bother her matter that was, yeah, that she grew outside by deer fencing. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. All uh, right. Yeah. Thanks, uh, you, you guys. Wanna, you do you want to open it to um, any questions? I wanted to do a couple things, Kathy, if it's okay. Yeah. Uh, so I know Kristen's on here, and I know, obviously, we Kara's, we've talked with Kara a couple times, but um, I just want maybe Kara just mention a little something, um, just just thirty second little whatever about your class and that um, what what it is because we're we're offering a coupon, a fifteen percent discount on Kara's class, but she could just quickly talk about it, and um, that'd be great. Thanks for the floor, Amy. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, the next online class we're going to do is going to be a Zoom like this. Um, we're going to work with uh, different pH modifiers and the kit that, I, um, that Kathy had shown in the beginning. So inside the kit, we have Matter, Osage, um, I think Hopi Sunflower Seeds and Marigolds. And we'll work with different um, bundle dyeing techniques to make like kind of a cosmic 
nebulous pattern on your fabric, like almost like pigment bombing. Um, and then I'll cover how to use different pH modifiers to play with um, the color range of all the different dye stuffs. You can like ask, it'll be kind of a mix of like me doing a demo and then also this like how to, so you'll be able to ask me questions the whole time. And then I will also um, be downloading and recording while we're teaching the class. So if you can't participate at the moment, I can give you the recording afterwards. And then also the kit you can keep buying if you don't feel like doing it at the same time as the class. Is going. Okay, I'm done, bye. So <laughs> words being nebulous and color bombing. Um, can I just make a, a quick um, addition? So um, Cara, we ended up putting in logwood instead Great. of the Hopi because it was so much brighter. Okay, amazing, um, even better, yeah. 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 And the, the photo that um, you guys posted actually, um, is Aaron still in here? Aaron, are you still in here? Oh my God, I'm Aaron's my amazing assistant who is now back home, but she actually made that shirt with logwood and matter and marigold. So it's gonna look something like that with all of your dye stuffs as well. So she took the lead on that one. So I just had to give her a little shout out for me. Oh, excellent. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> And we have, and I'll send you guys, I think I've already, I sent you guys yesterday links to that. So we we're selling the kit on our site. So Cara doesn't have to deal with that as part of her Thank class. You. We'll, we'll deal with it. And then um, Kristen is on here too. And I just um, wanted Kristen to say hi. Kathy's going to be on a class with her today, kind of co-teaching some Shibori techniques. And, but Kristen is, and again, I, I, I told you guys, I'm going to send a coupon code for Kristen's class too. It's 15% off her classes. And we, Kathy just put up a product that you can shop on our site now too for a natural dye pigment class. So I don't know if Kristen wants to just say something quickly about the, the class too. Can you unmute yourself? There she is. Hey everybody. Um, so if you've ever had like an exhausted dye bath and maybe it's something like you've grown the plants yourself and you forged them yourself. And so it's got even more of like a, I don't know, like a sentimentality to it. You don't have to dump it. And maybe you've seen this or maybe you've tried it yourself. Um, you can make a pigment out of it and store that forever. So you can keep your dye bath forever and ever. And I have a few things to show you so you can paint with these pigments and these are some pigments we actually made together in Maine last summer so oh beautiful yeah so it's going to be a lot of fun it's a shorter class so we'll do like a little bit of chemistry and I'll introduce you to binding agents and some fun printing techniques Fantastic. Thank Kristen. you. And uh, yeah, and Kathy, Kathy's, yeah, she's, Kathy's in the mix on some of Kristen's classes and Cara's classes and it's exciting. I know um, things are selling out quick too for these. Um, that's all I have to weigh in with, Kathy. Okay. Um, we've got five minutes. Do we want to take a couple more questions and then I'll um, wrap up? Um, Alexandra just put, uh, she just had, uh, if I grow matter in a pot, can I leave it out during the winter, a New England winter, or can I bring it indoors and keep it in a dark basement? I think you can store it indoors. So we have Seattle winter is very rainy. Um, the, the coldest it gets is freezing. So it's not that cold. It's not cold like you get it. But yeah, we keep it, um, I keep mine outdoors all the time. But I think if you had it in a pot that you could put it in a basement for the winter. If you have to pull dahlias in order to store them, I would do the same thing. You know, don't pull it out, just leave it in its pot. But um, put the pot in a, a place where it won't get, be exposed to the elements. Any other questions? Um, when does the coronavirus end? <laughs> coronavirus ends is May 3rd. To help repel it from us. We just got news yesterday that we're in for another month. We're inside for another I think this is about hope here. You're supposed to oh. say, yes. Yes. That would be the ancient Murasaki plant. That's right. Um, but let me just talk a little bit about next week. So, 
Um, Carrie Gunnerson, who is our lead dyer here for Botanical Colors, is going to be uh, working with a, a ferrous indigo vat. So this is a one, two, three type uh, indigo vat that instead of using fructose or henna as the reducing agent, we're using a ferrous sulfate or iron. And um, we've started switching over to this as a production um, vat and are kind of working our way through it. It's quite interesting. But we have a couple of different um, methods that we've started using that might be interesting to people. And so we're going to talk both about finding stuff around the house to dip into your vat like a mad woman, as well as doing some upcycling. So we'll have a vat here um, at my location and a vat at Carrie's location, and we'll both be doing uh, different things. And if we have time, um, Carrie's also been doing a um, how to go outside within 30 feet of your house and forage because you can't go any further because of um, stay at home restrictions. And so she's found some really interesting stuff to put into a dye pot that I've actually never used before. So uh, this is going to be exciting to see. Um, we're switching to a webinar format um, next week, hopefully. And what that will allow you to do is instead of Amy having to email everybody a link, you actually go online, you register for the webinar, and then a link is automatically uh, provided to you. So you're not having to last minute like be texting or emailing people, um, where is it? Because it will have already been sent to you. Yeah, I know a lot of people had problems where it went into their spam folder last night in the yeah. school. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, wow, thank you, everybody. If there are no further questions, any last minute questions? Don't be shy, guys. Can I, um, can I do a, just a couple more plugs for um, after? We've got, a, like, yeah, just a quick one. Bunch of different... Um, Feedback Friday is coming up. So we have that fer the Ferris Indigo vat for next week. Um, the week after that, we have, oh my gosh, which is, Judy. what's the next one? Judy, Judy that's right. Judy from BioHue will be talking. We, we sell her um, dye her inks. inks on our site. Yeah. So she's going to be answering all things dye ink, which is exciting. And then I know uh, Katrina Rodaba is also on this call and she's going to be, It'll be Fashion Revolution Day, April 24th, and she's gonna do a class on mending, dyeing, and kind of making do with what you have. And we're also trying to get another special guest, the founder of Fashion Revolution, to come say some words to us. And I know Brees is also going to be doing uh, on how to make books and um, dye paper in this, and be able to journal about what you're going through as you're natural dyeing. And, Kind of a more a beautiful, oh, beautiful Black Friday on that. So you can use it for swatches and, and put your swat your swatches in there daily as you're as you're doing your papers, but also write your feelings down too, what you're feeling going through all this isolation. You're feeling joy. Yes. <laughs> so much joy and gratitude. Yeah. No, I mean it's it's serious out there, you guys. And and I really, really want people to stay safe. Um Definitely reach out. I, I know that this this week I pretty much hit the bottom. I was I think it was on Tuesday or Wednesday. I was just like, this is just crazy. And you know, Seattle is actually a few weeks ahead of many other parts of um, the the world in where we're at. But yes, you guys stay safe, please. And um, if you're just feeling low, we are here with all sorts of things and ideas and the energy that's coming from these Feedback Fridays is just, I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to it because I've been sitting alone for, you know, a month now and got another month to go and um, it gets a little tiring, but okay. It's, it's for the common good and to really beat this, uh, this disease. So um thank you so thank so much you. yeah everybody and stay strong and um we'll see you next feedback friday thank you thank you, thank you guys thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.
Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Everybody's voices are so cute. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye, Jazzy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Amy. Bye, Amy. Bye, Kathy. Yeah, okay. Bye, Kathy. Care. Bye, Laura. Bye, Fletcher. <laughs> Bye, Kathy. <laughs> Bye. 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 Wash our Bye. dreams. Bye. Bye, guys.